Our gospel today comes from the Gospel of John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple sent out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been rolled on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and, and I'll, I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, she, that he had said these things to her. Let us pray. O Lord, may your words only be spoken and your words only heard. And we do ask this all for your love's precious sake. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, my Uncle Bob has been cleaning out his house, and so he sent me a box of my grandfather, my grandfather Brown's belongings. And in those belongings were some of my grandfather's sketchbooks. And so I went through these sketchbooks, and I happened to find a note, and though my grandfather be became a Christian in the later years of his life, in the earlier years of his life, he held Christianity decidedly suspect, okay? So he would attend church from time to time, but not so much because he believed, but because, because my grandmother liked that. And, uh, and so the pastor of that church wrote him a note, which he attached to his sketchbook, and the pastor says, Dear Joe, my heart was glad when I saw you in worship on Sunday. Please continue this spe splendid fellowship. Blessings, Pastor Greg. And then underneath it, in very small script, my grandfather wrote, does he know that I sit here and draw, that I sit here and draw pictures? <laughs> and then here's a picture of the preacher preaching. So he wasn't so much listening, he was sitting there drawing. Well, you may be sitting here drawing this morning, wondering if we are still glad to see you, if that is the case. And let me assure you, we are. We are just so happy that you are here. From wherever you come, uh, you know, it just pleases us no punch, and I, to, to, to no end. And I, I so look forward to this day because I just get to see so many people that I don't get to see any other time of the year. And if this is the only time of year we get to see you, then hallelujah, so be it. It's a glorious, it's a glorious, glorious thing. And I, and I, I don't want us to pass over that too quickly because I, I want us to think together just for a moment about what's happening right here in this room. Because right here in this room, we have people who are deeply committed to God and believe in God. And I'm willing to bet we have a fair number of people here this morning who don't believe at all. You came because it makes a family member happy. You came because you, you want to be a good part of it, but you're not sure about God. You might not even believe in God. We have people here this morning who are rabid Democrats, rabid left wing. Your Facebook page has been ablaze for weeks on end. I mean, it's just white hot. Your fingers are smoking here this morning. You know who you are. <laughs> and we have right-wing conservatives 
these are the happiest days of their lives. They're just, they get up this morning and say, God, it's good to be an American. And we have people here today who just come from everywhere. We have rich folks here today. We have some poor folks here today. We have white folks here today. We have black folks here today. We have people, and, and, and the beautiful thing is, is that we're all here together. We're all here worshiping. We're all here doing one thing. We're all here working together. Now, you might not believe. You might not actually be participating in the service. You might not sing this, this hymns, pray the prayers, but you're still here, and you're not disrupting the service, and your very presence and your willingness to go along with the service adds to what's happening here. In one way or another, we're all cooperating. We're all working together, no matter how different we are. And I want us to pause just for a moment because this is so unique in the world right now. In a world that is, in a country that is tearing itself apart at the seams, I want us just to reflect and take in for a moment what a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing this is. We are so glad you are here. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Yes. Uh huh. And we're here uh, for a lot of reasons, but certainly one of the reasons that many of us are here is to celebrate the love that was made to it, known to us in Jesus Christ. And we believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, and then in Jesus being raised from the dead, that was God saying that death will not have the last word, but my love will, that it is love that has the last word in this universe. And for anyone who has lost someone in this year, or anyone who has lost someone in previous years, and it's one of those deaths you never get over, a death that we think about, Easter is a line in the sand that says death is not the last word that there is a life after this life, and that we will see those we love, but who are no longer with us. And Easter makes that pledge, and we take great comfort from it. But Easter is also an opportunity to decide how we'll let that love live on in us. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we did a... Uh, we did an Easter egg a community event, an Easter egg hunt, and we had crafts and face painting so much for the whole community. And the community comes out, and it's one of those events we love because it really is this community that comes to it. And I went down before one of the Easter egg hunts, and I was walking through the crowds and talking with people and meeting people. And there was a little boy there who was maybe four or five years old, and I talked to him for a moment, and I said, are you going to do something fun for Easter? And with big eyes, he looked up with me, and he just held up his bag, and he said, this, this is my Easter. That one little bag and an event that was put on, that was his whole Easter. That was, but I'm glad we were able to provide that Easter for him. Our Easters are so rich and full of blessings. I, sometimes I think we don't realize how gifted we are. Uh, we use it as a bad word to be privileged, and privilege is only a bad word if we don't use our privilege to help other people, but, but actually, we have so much to be thankful for in the privileges that we enjoy. And so on this Easter day, what we want to do is we just want to remember that our Easter is rich and full, and, but we don't want to, and, but we want to allow that richness and that fullness to let us love one another better, to think of how the love of God that was made known in, in Easter, that was made known in the resurrection of Christ, can live on in our lives. It was love that rolled away that stone that first Easter morning. But now it's up to you and it's up to me to keep that stone rolling. Will you keep that stone rolling? I remember a story which I didn't witness myself, and in fact, I only heard recently, but uh, it's a story in which I take uh, some pleasure. It's a story that my brother-in-law, Dave, tells, and it's a story of, of about my father. And they were going to Disney World. My parents at that time lived in Orlando, Florida. And so they were going to go to Disney World. It was, and my brother was still young. My brother was uh, the guitarist who was standing right here in the band. And, uh, and they were going to go to, to Disney World. And Dave and uh, my sister Claire, they were either just married or were about to get married. And Dave had a lot of respect for my dad. And so he was sort of watching my father for, to, to, to see how to be a good father. 
Now, you might not know this looking at me because I'm not, I'm sort of wardrobe challenged. I'm, I'm sort of appearance challenged because uh, I was the firstborn in my family. But my brother is the youngest, and he was more or less raised by three sisters. So he was always really well dressed. He, he was what you might call a dandy. I mean, he, you know, and then <laughs> the old pictures you look at of my brother, he's always sporting these outfits and these haircuts. And, and so when they were going to Disney World, he was wearing these really, really fancy shoes that were never made to be worn. And, uh, and they were going to Disney World, and you walk all through Disney World, it's a long night, and my dad looked at my brother and said, I don't think you want to wear those shoes. You know, they're going to hurt, and you're, you're not going to want to wear them. And my brother said, no, i got to wear them. And I'm, I'm kind of butchering this story, because my brother really needs to tell it, because he, he remembers the outfit and why these shoes were so important, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was a cold night, and, but, and, but, he, but he really wanted to wear these shoes. Well, they got to Disney World. My, my dad said like three or four times to my brother, are you sure you want to wear those shoes? And my brother just rolled his eyes and wore those shoes. Well, they got to Disney World. They walked in the park. They'd been there. I think they'd taken two steps inside the park. And what do you think my brother said? Ow, my feet hurt. These shoes are so painful. My brother's watching this. And of course, he's expecting my father to say, well, I told you three times to change your shoes. You didn't change your shoes, so live with it. But my dad looks at my brother and he says, all right, I'll change shoes with you. And so my dad sits down on the bench with my brother. My brother takes off his shoes, and to much his embarrassment to wearing his dad's old uh, man shoes, but, but, but he didn't want his feet to hold, hurt any longer. He puts those shoes on. My dad put... My brother, and then he cobbled around <laughs> Disney World all night long. And my brother looked at that, and he, my brother-in-law looked at that and said, you know, I thought what it meant to be a father was, this is the choice you made, now live with it. But that night, I understood what it really means to be a father. And I can tell you the reason that my dad made that choice was because of the way that he had experienced the love of Jesus in his life. And he understood that in many ways, he had, that he, my father, had worn shoes that don't, I'm speaking metaphorically, had worn shoes that didn't quite fit. And that Jesus had come to him and said, Carl, I'll take those shoes off and I'll wear them myself. You wear my shoes. You receive my grace. You let me love you. My dad, who didn't feel like he deserved that love, always felt like God was saying to him, let me love you. Let me shower my grace upon you. And it was just up to my dad to receive it. And so he shared that love whenever and wherever he could. And that becomes a challenge for us who on this Easter morning think of the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected love of God, how we too, in very practical and real ways, can share that love in our lives. One of the most important ways we can do that is simply by being kind. And I hope today you will make every effort to be kind. You will make every effort to make the most of this day to be good to the people who are around you, to linger at the dinner table instead of wolfing it all down and enjoy the comfort and presence of the people with you, to thank the cook and say, my goodness, this meal was just so very good. When the meal is done, to perhaps go into the kitchen and say to the cook, who is probably also doing the dishes, you know, you cooked the whole meal. Why don't you go rest your feet and let me do the dishes today? To instead of flocking to the TV and watching the NFL, uh, not the, the NHL, the National Hockey League uh, finals, in which the Pittsburgh Penguins <laughs> and the Washington Capitals are both, see, in this room, we have Pittsburgh Penguin fans and Washington Capitol fans, and we're all, what a beautiful thing, what a beautiful thing. Uh, but not to glue yourself to the TV set, to spend time with each other, to love one another, to be kind to each other. That, my friends, is the keeping the glory of the resurrected Christ alive. The stone that love rolled away, that Jesus might live again, is the stone that we keep on rolling when we are kind to one another, when we love one another. Amen. Amen. Amen.